Uh, welcome to Rock the Cash Box. Unfortunately, I didn't have a better name. I want something clever. And in the end, what we're going to be talking about today is practical, hands-on protocol analysis. While it's cool and everyone's probably here because the words ATM hacking were in the title, there's real-world applications to looking at protocols from this level and working with protocols and trying to reconstruct them, especially when you have old protocols. See how they work, see how to reconstruct them so you can better design you know, defenses and in the future design better protocols. So about me, I go by Spicy Wasabi on Twitter. I'm a security researcher of mostly embedded devices and IoT. So ATMs fall right in that category. I am also a perpetual volunteer. I work on quite a few different events, mostly competitions. One of them being the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition and the other being the Collegiate Pen Testing Competition. While those are a lot of words, both of them are both college competitions for students to participate and gain real world skills. As an organizer of those events, I get to be essentially the game maker and build the challenges and build the competition into something that actually exists. So that brings us to the next point. This was built for a competition called CPTC, the pen testing competition, and students were required to build or maintain, or not maintain, defend a bank. And, um, well, pen test a bank, sorry. Um, and as part of that, I, had, I was working with another guy. His nickname is JRWR, and he works and lives in Rochester. This was a national <laughs> building event for this ATM work. And without him, I don't think any of this would have been possible. So I really appreciate being able to work with him, and I hope and I get a chance again in the future. But I'm sure you're not here to hear about me. You want to hear about rocking the cash box. So what, what are we going to be doing here? Well, one, we're going to be working with ATMs. And inside an ATM is something called the cash box, which actually contains the money. And so we're going to make the ATM eventually just dispense money. And so that sounds really scary, but what this talk isn't is we are not modifying the ATMs. It, we, it isn't about hacking ATMs. It isn't about modifying the firmware or dumping the firmware and figuring out how to make it do something that it isn't supposed to do. We are only doing pure protocol analysis and working on a closed environment. This stuff does not directly go into a real world. And if you were doing this where it was a real ATM that's still in service, that would be very bad. We, the reason pr primarily we built our own protocol um, processor for this stuff was because we wanted to make a fake bank where we could have students have to experience money getting dumped from accounts and have to deal with that situation. If it was real world, a bank would probably not be very happy with that. So this is meant for the best reasons. and. We're specifically talking about that protocol work. So let's talk about the protocols. Well, these ATMs are very old. They were released in the early 2000s. I think they stopped getting developed in 2004. So we're talking a Windows XP era system at best. Well, in fact, these systems don't even run Windows XP. They're running Intel 16-bit uh, microcontrollers that provide the entire operation for the ATM. And the ATMs may be 15 years old, 16 years old, but the protocol they use is even older. It's almost 30 to 40 years old and has not been changed much in any way since then. And this probably gives you an idea why this is such a problem is because this protocol is still in use today. These ATMs still exist and if you see one, they are running this same protocol or one of its variations. So what we're going to have to do instead is a little gentle persuasion. As I said, we're not hacking the ATMs directly. We're not using some exploits to get to a shell on the ATM. What we're actually doing is persuading the ATM to respond to us and do what we're need, needing it to do. So again, back to the background. The students were tasked with pen testing a bank. The bank had many simulated systems, including databases, ba um, accounting uh, software, and everything was custom written that the teams had to evaluate and work with. In fact, in the audience, there's actually some of the competitors today, so um, hopefully they'll get a chance to see the, the work that went into this. Uh, but we thought, wait, what about getting ATMs? And it turns out you can actually just go on eBay and buy pretty much anything. You can buy voting machines, you can buy ATMs, you can buy payphones. I don't 
there's a very weird world in eBay of buying pretty much anything, and it's, it's readily available. And it so happened we found the deal of a lifetime. For less than $500, we could get 12 fully functional ATMs. The only thing we had to do was pay for shipping. Well, good news, you can rent a truck. And so an adventure started. We had to somehow get 3,500 pounds of ATMs over 1,000 miles from Ohio to New York and get them there in working order. Well, that was no small feat. ATMs are heavy, and so that makes turning a little bit of a, a scary situation. You will notice in this picture, I know it's a little cut off, if you do a count carefully, there's four ATMs on one side and three on the other. That makes a little challenging because what does a sharp turn do? Can cause you to tip. And that almost happened to the people driving these ATMs in. But luckily for us, only one ATM did not survive the journey. And we were able to get them into their new home. So with these ATMs in our presence, we had to figure out how to make them work. There's no documentation. We weren't official resellers of these ATMs. We just bought them. So we had product manuals. We had product information, text sheets. But that doesn't really talk to us about how the ATM works. What it does say is go contact a local vendor to get your ATM hooked up, which is great and also useless. So you know, we wanted to see what they could do. So this is. The beautiful noises of ATMs all plugged in at once. Wonderful dial-up sounds. And so we had to figure out how these things worked. Oh, wait, why is there two slides of the same one? OK. Oh, well. Um, but the thing was, we didn't know how they worked. And they were in really bad shape. For ATMs to be that cheap, you have to imagine there's something wrong with them. And there was definitely something wrong with them. These all came, as we found out, because they still contained all the f information that they were last set with. They came from waffle houses and gas stations. And there was no exception. So most of these ATMs were absurdly sticky. And a few of them even contained rats and other um, leftovers that were absolutely disgusting. One of them actually had wrappers inside of it. Somehow in the base where the, the, the safe is, there were wrappers and old, like, just leftovers just in there. It was awful. So we had to sanitize these quite a bit. <clears throat> and then once we did that and we were not afraid to touch the, you know, we, were, we weren't worried about touching them, we had to figure out the first task. You know, it was a very simple requirement. Communicate to the ATM. And that seems easy, but it really isn't. So, <laughs> you, you know, it turns into just a few things. So you have these ATMs, and you want to make it as realistic as possible. So that means are you, you can't just replace the guts with some Arduino controller and say, OK, it's an ATM. And if you did that, how would you get all the other components to work? And you want to make the teams connect to their ATMs directly and have what they're doing affect the actual outcome of the ATMs. So if someone steals all the money from a fake account, you want the ATM to show the balance is zero. So you have to make it realistic and work. So we had to start getting a little creative. We saw that there was a modem line. Actually, there's two. And we had to start figuring out how it worked. So here's the, one of the pages from the product text sheets. It, and as you can see, it really tells you nothing. It says, here's a keypad, here's a printer, here's the cash dispenser, communication. And you can see it supports up to Ethernet LAN capabilities. Um, of course, none of them really did. And if you want to get that upgrade, it's $1,000 per unit to get the upgrade to Ethernet. So we decided, let's get creative. I'm sure dial-up isn't that hard. People were using it for years. And that's where our adventure started. So to do that, we started plotting out. If you're looking at a piece of hardware that you don't understand, you don't want to just jump into it and say, OK, let me see how this goes. You want to identify the components. So the, we did. We went through piece by piece and tried to identify the ATMs. And there were some interesting situations that we found while we were doing this. First, the pin pad contains the crypto keys, which is a very interesting situation. There is a reason. JRWR explained it to me, and I forgot. But there is a reason for having the crypto keys on the pin pad. And it's in case someone tries to tamper with it, it'll, it'll become unusable. I believe it's something along those lines. Um, but it, it's actually a documented feature um, and a, a standard for how to implement this stuff. The printer controller also has the same 16-bit uh, microprocessor. And 
the dispensers, there was a quite a bit of variety. They, what it turns out is that they use commodity hardware. This is like a building block, like building your PC. You want to swap out the graphics card or something like that. Instead of graphics cards, though, they have printer spoolers, they have card readers and things like that that you can just easily swap and can speak the own protocol. They're not using PCI bus or PCI express. In fact, they're only using serial. So that gives you an idea of how much bandwidth these things actually support over these protocols that they're communicating over. And they don't change because you have to use these year over year. Some of the uh, print screen, uh, the silk screen prints were from 1985. Um, so these things are very old and they're still used. These, these are actively manufactured. So here's the first one. You can see the core, you know, the main processor and up top, the big disattached piece is the modem. In the front, there is the serial ports. It looks fairly standard. And then we found a couple like this, and we, we still don't know to this day what it is. So you'll see there's the main processor. There's some other changes to the board. It's a different revision. We're like, okay, that's not too surprising. On the top, soldered right on top of another chip is this little board on top. I don't know if it's clear, but over here, there is a separate board just on the top, just sitting there. Has its own microcontroller, has its own clock, has its own memory, and some dip switches. We really couldn't figure out what this was for, but on some of the ATMs, it was soldered directly onto the existing board. And so that was kind of interesting. So we don't know what that means, but it, it's also not documented. It seems like people are just ma repairing these with whatever they can, and sometimes that means just soldering on like an attachment piece. That's what we think, at least. So <coughs> again, we, we're, we're trying to make the ATMs work. So. We, we discovered all the different components, and we're like, okay, we now know roughly this is a dial-up ATM. It's going to be using, not, it's not running anything with Windows, so we can't analyze the protocol on there. We have to figure out how this thing communicates, and we have access to the menu interfaces. And all they talk about is either a localized payment processor or a remote payment processor. So how this works is ATMs, especially these dial-up ones, you don't need a very fancy communication protocol. Hopefully it's encrypted, but you don't need a fancy one to communicate to a local payment processor. And in many cases, what they'll do is they'll have a local payment processor for an ATM, and that's sitting behind, you know, wherever, inside an office, and that connects the, in the internet. And then th that connects to whatever payment application and protocol that you want, whether it's web-based or anything else, th that's an actual payment system. Or you can send out to a remote site where you actually have a bank of numbers that you set up and connect to. And those are actually services that you can subscribe to and they'll take your payment and also send the fees automatically. Well, the problem was we didn't have either of those. And so we had to figure out how to do this. So we were like, okay, let's emulate a local payment processor. That can't be that hard. Well, of course, we didn't have one. So it, as it turned out, we actually got an, a local payment processor the day before the competition started. Um, but it turns out it supports only SSL, not TLS, so very good. And it requires another protocol to communicate to the internet. So we, we couldn't just analyze it when we tried. So we left that alone, but we want to emulate that as much as possible. So the plan was to take the ATM, connect it to a PBX, which would emulate the, to a Raspberry Pi, which would emulate the payment processor, and then send that to our cloud and our, proce our, our competition network. Well, the reality was a little more complicated. So we had our dev system, which connected via a jump box to the, a, a local Raspberry Pi, which connected to multiple USB modems, which then connected to PBXs, which then connected to the ATMs. Very simple. And it was not, it was not simple. Sometimes this system, w this complex web of, of connectivity would break. And because I'm working on the West Coast and the ATMs are on the East Coast, and to make it even more comfy, they were in an, a storage um, um, building. We would have to sometimes, I'd have to call up JRWR and be like, hey, I accidentally crashed the ATMs again. Please go reboot them. So it was quite a hands-on process. And sometimes, because of time zones, that would be like 6 PM or 8 PM his time. And we'd be like, OK, let's just reboot it and start working again and have to start all over again. But you know, it turns out. It was just luck that we had, ex well, we, JRWR had experience with PBX systems. He actually had an old PBX system lying around, and we had USB modems. So 
we realized that we could actually make all the stuff start working and just simulate and start listening on the, the USB modems to what was being received. We had no idea what we were going to get or what they were saying, but we wanted to try. So the final implementation looked like this. We had multiple PBX systems um, with a bank of ATMs connected to a single PBX, which then connected to a Raspberry Pi, which then connected to a relay server. And this obviously sounds very complicated, but this allowed us to connect and bypass certain firewall limitations that we had. And it allowed us to keep all the ATMs on the same network and troubleshoot very quickly. So as I was saying, we rediscovered a lot of stuff during this endeavor. We rediscovered time sharing because we only had two ATMs connected. And so if we're both working on the same ATMs at the same time, it's not going to work. They're going to dial on each other. And we also rediscovered real at commands, not the at modem commands you're used to with cellular modems. These are real at commands where you have to do auto redial and auto reconnect and setting the mode of the communication. The, it was a little bit of a lost art. And it turns out that working weird hours w is really hard for getting something working. So we actually spent many Saturdays where I would get up at 6 a.m. and be working until, you know, really late. And out on the East Coast, he was also working, and we would be in the, he would be in the actual warehouse working with the ATMs, and I'd be tinkering with the systems trying to get them to work. So time sharing, it, it works. But for the protocols, it turns out US robots, US robotics still exists in a little sense, sort of. And it, they, they sort of exist, not very good, but they have some documentation on their modems, and their modems are pretty good. They, you know, they were the standard for years. So they, their documentation is fairly well followed through by any implementation. So it turns out to get the modems to auto answer, you do ATSO equals two. Simple. That's really clear. And so we got the modems to auto answer. We got the ATMs to auto dial. And so we started getting this repeated dialing process that we could start looking to decode the messages. And it was interesting because we couldn't recognize anything. We set the ATMs in their menus to automatically set all of the values to be zeros. We figured zeros are going to be easy to detect. They're going to be a big pattern. And we'll be able to see when a different type of data changes. We don't care what the actual message is. As long as we can see a big chunk of zeros, we know when the message starts and what the protocol is going to be in the end. Well, the problem is the ATM never really responded. We sent data. We sent commands. We thought we were sending the correct messages. It just didn't work. And then we discovered some challenges. So, you know, we started with PySerial thinking, yeah, Python's going to be a good development environment for this. And during one of our endeavors, we actually switched to PHP for a while because that actually was more reliable. And I'll never forgive myself for that, but it actually worked a lot better for testing. Um, and then we went to Screen because we thought, okay, maybe we need an interactive serial processor. And we're like, okay, Screen's not really working for us. Let's try Minicom because that's really designed for modems. And then we found Intercept TTY, this random GitHub project that this guy made that allows you to take a serial port and split it off to a file, capture all the raw data, and then forward it onto an actual application. So this is when we actually start getting our progress. So serial is unreliable. Sometimes messages don't come through in entirety. If you're not listening at the right moment, you've just missed the message and you have to wait till the next cycle, which means the ATM has to reconnect and or get rebooted. And there was no clear pattern. And what I mean by patterns is you're trying to find in a, mess in a bunch of hacks something that looks like it's repeating so you can find the correct messages. So we thought, maybe is it encrypted? But if it's encrypted, how does it know what the encryption key is? How do we, is there a preamble or anything like that? So this is what we started doing. And this is just a quick screen grab I got. So when we're doing the work, you're looking for at an unknown protocol and an unknown message. You don't know what you're looking at. And the goal is to identify the same messages and see what they are and maybe find in between patterns. So here you can see the 0D, 0A. OK, I found one. Then in the next message, it's also there. But then all this random data. I found a 9-4. OK, that's good. And then I found this whole string of 0D, 0As. You might be wondering, the messages look very similar, right? Like the, the 0D, 0A. Hmm. 
So we had a big oops moment that we kind of spent a couple weeks working on this and then didn't realize what we'd been seeing. And this is the ASCII decoded version of the hex that you saw above. And it turns out we had been decoding the, looking for decoding the modems. We had gotten the modem messages and what we were actually seeing as repeated patterns were actually the ring, 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 connect 9600, no carrier, and then repeating. So we spent a lot of time trying to decode that. And when you get into the zone, you have to think about that pr when you're looking at m message processing. It's easy to fall into like, well, we have to decode this complex message. In reality, if I had just checked ASCII, we would have seen this weeks before and not stumbled on the same problem. But in that message, there's actually a bunch of hex. And so once we found the actual hex, we realized, OK, maybe there is a message here. Something that isn't actually ASCII because it's still not decoding, which is a really good feeling when you've messed up that badly. So what could those 7.7s seven be? Now, in protocols, there's something called a preamble. Many protocols have this. And what it'll be is a repeating sequence of numbers, or, or, or bytes, I should say. And you're trying to find that. It, it, it dif differentiates noise from actual data. And here in my graph, you can see actual data starts at the, the very end where the question mark is, at the far right side. And at the beginning are different types of message where you're sending 7-7 seven, seven hex, and you can see how it repeats, and you can identify that, or sending a bunch of FF and finding the change. So we start on the theory that maybe what we're actually seeing is a preamble. And we kept getting stuck. And it just so happened that when we were going through it, we were looking through text sheets, and we found some old manuals on provisional guides on what protocols were used. So we thought, OK, maybe we're onto something. So we started switching around the system, and we looked at the fact that the pro there's different modes. There's standard 1, 2, and 3, which tell us everything about the protocols. And it turns out standard 3 is what we actually implemented. Um, but we didn't know. And EPS link and ST3 plus link, we still don't know what those are. I'm, they're they're Googleable, but they're not described. And that's the problem. Is a lot of this payment stuff is not described for presumably obvious reasons. I they don't want to share it because you have to. It's a licensing thing. I don't really know, but um, we just couldn't get a hold of it. So from the documentation, we realized the modem has to operate. We had to set the modem speed to 2400 baud, seven bits of data, and one stop bit. And for those of you who have actually worked with old serial protocols, I'm sure that makes perfect sense to you. But for someone who's never worked with old serial protocols, it's a little bit confusing. We, I have clarified that because it said ASCII plus one stop bit. Now, it turns out, and I'll get to this in a minute, ASCII is not the same as it used to be. Um, so we'll, we'll get there. But it says even parity, the start of the message is an STX character, um, there's an ETX character, an LRC, and then an ENQ message. So th these are all ASCII control characters. We were easily able to identify those, but we didn't see them. And so the control flow is supposed to work something like this, where the ATM dials out, it gets an ENQ, sends a request, gets a response, acknowledges the response, we send an end of table message, and then we disconnect. That's if it's working. Of course, it never was that easy. So based on the documentation, we need to send an ENQ to get the ATM to start transmitting when it, it connected. And it still replied, but after some delay, there was a pause of about 30 seconds. And I'm sure people here are starting to wonder, what was the 30 seconds? And it turns out the 30 seconds was a failure. It was timing out because it wasn't getting the right message. But the protocol is based on VisaNet. And there's an old FRAC article we found when we discovered that it was based on VisaNet from 1994. This FRAC article in it, and this is how classic this FRAC um, article was, is it was advertising DEF CON 2 and saying how great a hacker conference it would be. Um, bring all your friends. And it was a lot cheaper back then, too. But um, it said, send it as it, 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 the article was written in such a way that this was just common knowledge, um, which it really isn't. But it said, as you are very well aware, you're, you have all your dial up numbers, and when you send an ENQ, 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 you will get an actual response from the VisaNet uh, merchants, clearly. So the, we tried sending ENQ, 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 
and it spit back data immediately. No delay this time. The problem was, again, if you look back to the control flow, where is the ENQ, the AC, or the NAC? Well, I'll let you decode the, the bytes by hand, but they're not there. And so we start getting worried. Um, we put the ATMs, we verified that they were in single mode, because there's a batch mode where it can send bulk messages. So like if you do a transaction, it'll say, good job, I've done your transaction, do you want to do anything more? And then you say yes, and then you keep saying yes. You've probably seen this at ATMs. That, what that does is when you press finish, it actually transmits all the transactions at once. I don't know um, when this would be useful these days, but that's what it was designed for. And so we put them in single mode, so every transaction is a new dial-up tr um, transaction, and it sends it. So we, we voted for the simpler method, but was it the parity bits? So when it said ASCII plus one parity bit, we thought, okay, ASCII's eight bits, right? Every, you know, eight bits of ASCII, you know, you, you have all these bytes and you just type in S. No, I see a lot of head shaking. And this was our mistake. We'd never dealt with good old parity bits before. And it's something that when you Google parity bits, a lot of people have a lot of opinions and a lot of different answers. I don't know why there's so many different answers, but there should be only one, but apparently not. So we tried shifting the data. We said, okay, it's nine bits, and we're gonna frame it. One parity bit plus eight bits of ASCII. That yielded in some even worse data. Then we thought maybe, you know, what, what's going on here? So breakthrough we found the actual correct representation of parity bits. And as you can see, ASCII is actually seven bits. In modern systems, the eighth bit is either unused or just used as like a, a buffer. But the, in, in older systems, it was actually used as an error detection. So it would be even parity if it was an odd number of bytes before it. So you can see zero through six um, bits. If that was odd, this, the seventh bit would be one. And that makes sense. So once we figured that out, and again, this is some of these things looking at old protocols, you're not used to working at this level, or at least we weren't. But you find this, <coughs> and it responded. And then we were able to start decoding the messages because we, again, set all the values to known characters. So I've, I've abbreviated this because this is actually from my notebook when I was working on this, um, and we were getting so many different dumps from the ATMs that we were just trying to abbreviate it. So it's start a character, then it goes terminal ID, Field separator, uh, the um, encryption code, I believe, the field separator. We couldn't identify one byte or two bytes. A field separator, ETX, and then the LRC. Uh, as it turns out, a lot of the protocol fields are optional. So what you think might be a required field is actually just optional. And there's no, the only indication that th it is required is that if you have more bytes than you expected. There's no field headers saying this is a required byte, which is really confusing. So we had to actually account for if there's just extra bytes, redo the processing completely. So we started doing things to try to process the data, and we, found we finally ran into one final challenge, the LRC. Again, this is where there shouldn't be a lot of opinions online on how an LRC is implemented, but as it turns out, there is, well, for a single byte. Um, if you're doing a one byte LRC, there shouldn't be a lot of opinion on how this is done. But as it turns out, there are a lot. And a lot of people are misreporting CRCs as LRCs. And they're not exactly the same. One uses a table, the other one does not. So it, it was a lot of time wasted, but we kept getting um, 0x95. And because of the parity bit, that's actually NAC, which is hex 15. So once we got this all communicating, the ATM wanted something from us, and we weren't sure what it wanted. Well, it turns out it wanted the host download request and the host totals request. Um, the host download request identifies the ATM. It says, hey, I am, and it says its ID. You reply with a set of encryption keys. Encryption keys are very interesting in this. It supports a maximum of triple des encryption <coughs> with a left-right key buffer. Um, so you can have half the key actually known so you can use it to have multiple um, payment processors on a network or on dialing out, which is interesting. It's a 64-bit key. The standard is X9.8, um, which actually describes how to send a 64-bit key um, represented via ASCII. It's kind of interesting that it is a standard, but it is. So we were able to implement that. 
and we used our simple one key structure. So we then got data. And this is from the actual pr um, original processor. And it's really small, but you can see that it receives the message <coughs> where up here is the terminal ID. And you can see the offsets that I'm processing. And then down here, it sends the encryption key. And then the ATM still was angry. Well, one final point. Remember I said it needed a host totals? Yeah, see there, there's the 15. We forgot to send the host totals. So host totals sends the date and time. It's like NTP um, with fee calculations. So um, it sends the date, time, and fees that the ATM has to send. And so if you've ever used an ATM out of network and it says in the little bottom, it says 50 cent fee or $1 fee, that's actually set via the ATM when it's initially connecting to the processor. So if it's unplugged, reconnects, it downloads that only once or during an update state. But we realized, OK, we're doing all this implementation in linear code, which was very hard to do. Like, this is not a very e Protocols like this are, are parallel, so it's very hard to, or not parallel, but they're, they're states. And as you're guessing, it should be a state machine. Doing it in a linear fashion is very bad. So we built state machines. And this is the eventual, what we reconstructed on how the ATM worked. So it took a very long time to build that model. But with that, we, we have, it allowed us to take code that looked like this, and I'm just showing you the count. You don't need to read the code, into something that actually has handlers and can call messages and process them. This allowed us to build, as we discovered new messages in the protocol, to add support for them. And this happened quite a lot. So you can see, here's another message print from the ATM, and it succeeded. So when it finally gets, um, when it's less angry at us, it actually says this. And so now we have a working ATM. And we, once the host totals were processed, we were, we were good to go. That gave us a design decision choice on how we were going to implement this for the competition, of course. And we decided that all host downloads and host totals would be run on the local payment processor that we built. And all the other requests would go sent, be sent out to a centralized payment processor. We don't know how, if this is how it really works in the real world, but that's how we did it. So first test run. It's processing. So there you go. We also have discovered another thing. Um, we're not rich. We can't load this thing up with the $220 bills that it's designed for. So we went out and got Monopoly money, essentially, fake money that you can use for costumes and stuff like that. It does not like that. It's designed and weighted for real uh, money, real currency. It turns out that if you need to get weighted currency that's the same weight as US money for doing something like this, Jamaican money. It's the same weight, size, and everything, texture, everything, and it won't get shredded. Um, we learned that one, so that was interesting. But in all, um, there were 20 different response messages that we had to figure out from this machine. Um, we, we used only eight. Um, response messages are, after it does the transactions, what it says in responses. So zero is true, one is false, as you can see, there, but there's three ones and three zeros. 19 is an error, and it just goes on and on. On these ATMs, only one track of data is processed, track one. Track one is what actually contains your credit card information. Track two actually contains your name and other information. It's only taking the raw credit card, or debit card, as, as the case may be. Um, padding is kind of interesting. Um, $20 is, is floating. But in ATM world, it's 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0. And if you misalign the zeros, you get a very different number. And that's also why there's 10 reasons I shouldn't be an ATM processor. Um, and also, I will point out that the terminal fee is equal to the amount that you request. So if you request $20, your fee is $20. And if you request $100, your fee is $100. It's, it's a really economical um, ATM. So another little uh, fun video from getting it working. You can see the code working. And dumping out money. So. 
uh, I don't know why it's doubling up on the videos, but um, we're going to switch gears for a second. Because as I said, this is an embedded track. You know, everyone's here probably because they want to hear about the hacking. But ATMs like this still exist. The fact that we could just buy them and they were used as recently as last June means that these ATMs still are in use. These are products that were built by some engineer probably, you know, 20 years ago. You know, talk about longevity, you get to see your product everywhere and still it's, it's almost like the Windows XP background, the guy who took that, he still sees it everywhere. Um, but that means that you have to design something for embedded that lasts a long time. Is the design of your system going th that you're putting together actually capable of handling that? What type of Linux are you running? If you're going to be using Linux, what are you planning ahead? Are you taking into account that maybe at some point you're not going to be able to update the system and you're going to run out of resources. It's, you're going to have it stuck. How are you hardening that system? So, you know, people need to make these things more modular. I was saying there's a whole business of just replacement parts, but they're expensive. Um, when you're designing embedded systems, maybe the plan is to make them modular. I was looking at um, OmniTurris, or Turris, I guess is the company name, but they actually have a modular router that you can just swap the p components and you can keep the, the Ethernet part and upgrade the main core. So modular designs like that are good. I know they're very out of reach for most companies. But designing something where you can have either a service technician upgrade or provide that support is, is very important. Because otherwise, you're going to end up with these ATMs, which are still running 16-bit processors, which in and of itself is not bad. But the fact that they still are using 3DES and, uh, or triple DES, and they're using SSL, like th that's that should be not allowed at this point. Um, you know, it should be easy for a, a user of your product to get updates. And then let's get to the protocol. The protocol is another interesting legacy product. It's 40 years old at minimum, maybe a little newer because they have revisions. But that means that this protocol was designed for an entirely different world, a dial-up world. It's now being encapsulated in many cases over a 4G antenna. Um, and in some cases, they've actually improved it so it's actually using you know, more modern communication methods. But it, let's just talk about the one that still exists, that it's really out of date. It doesn't, it's plain text for 90% of the transactions. Someone can just intercept and adjust the amounts. And all the data is sent over almost plain text. The some of the data, the PIN key is encrypted, but if you get the credit card number, does it really matter? How many places verify the PIN? You can just do a transaction in many cases. So there are dis there's issues, and in this case, one question I have wondered about this protocol is why was the whole message not encrypted in uh, triple DES? Sure, it's easy to break, but as someone looking at this protocol. I would never have been able to easily implement it if it was actually encrypted. So, you know, let's let's you know work towards more secure pro um, systems. Use standards that you know are going to be around for a while, and that you can easily switch around. I know that's not a cure-all and be-all for everything, but you know, use things that you can maintain that aren't going to like even the most legacy web server these days is still using is still around. You have protocols and libraries to, or not protocols, but you have libraries that are designed to support newer encryption methods. Like look at Arduino. It can support pretty much any modern encryption standard for web requests. If this thing was using a more open protocol, in theory, the firmware could be upgraded to support that. So, you know, plan ahead. Plan ahead for using as many open standards as you can. And you know, if you're going to be doing protocol analysis, take some of the tips. You're, you're going to make mistakes because you get into this little zone where you're stuck working at things and trying to figure out the fine details and sometimes you're too into the protocol to realize you need to just step back. And, you know, of course, you know, if you're implementing these again, just, you know, plan ahead. These things are around and there's a lot of protocols like this. Think of Modbus, you know, that the solution for Modbus security is isolated as much as possible. And, that you know we, we can do better than that these days. So um, that's it. Um, hopefully you guys have had a fun ride with getting um, ATMs working, as I did. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter. And uh, happy to answer any questions. Sure. I'm curious um, from the project.
object, uh, just in balance, how much would you say was reverse engineering? Just to say, if you like had complete documentation, to have to figure out something that should be documented. How, what, what percentage would you say was reverse engineering? Um, the, the amount of pure reverse engineering, because we were getting fragments of documentation through the whole thing, it, I'd say it's pretty small, but the actual implementation of the protocol, by happenstance, we were able to find the, you know, some of the protocol guide, um, trend, a provisional one. So we were able to take that and modify it into what the actual protocol was. So there was still a lot of, there's still a lot of effort, um, but the, the fact is that if, for all these systems, you, there's, there's quirks that aren't documented. There's no, there's no, none of the stuff followed one-to-one -one with what we had found. So there's a lot of work in getting the components to actually work. So it, it, it's not a huge amount of reverse engineering, but it, it's a lot of researching and tinkering. So, yeah. And any other? Uh, the currency reader, um, as far as I know, they were all part of, um, oh boy, uh, we, uh, I'll put up the, red currency. uh, well, it has, it has a, it has a light reader on the, or a reader on the, on the machine to see if it's get the bills, um, but, um, where is the, there it is, so as far as I know, all parts were th for or through, Hyusung and Tranax, so it's going to be whatever vendor and design for that. So um, there's you got your EMV card reader, the the currency dispenser with its you know basic checking, uh, like to make sure the bills are coming out. Um, the the screen was its own group of components. The printer was its own group of components, and they all communicated over serial um, for the most part. Yeah. So as again, the 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 reader is more just in this machine was just to make sure that the the machine was dispensing money, rather than actually like it was it was just seeing money's here, okay, and because if it had an issue, it would it would actually lock the ATM up and say. Tra um, error and it would try to do a reversal and then undo the transaction but um, I'm sure in more advanced more modern ATMs there's actually a reader checking and accepting money these only allow to dispense money and so they're only tracking the currency that's in there yeah, any other The pin is transmitted encrypted, but the card number is transmitted plain text. Yeah, it's an interesting design choice. I'm sure there's a reason for it in VisaNet, but um, the, 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 that whole thing is transmitted to the payment processor. In our case, when we built our payment processor, we decoded the pin and ignored the pin um, because for this competition, we didn't have to worry about any of the actual processing of real data. We, we had cards that we wrote to and they weren't real credit cards. Right, I mean, yeah, my understanding is that it's been last credit card, so the processor then said, okay. Oh, it's sent, yeah, you're, you are correct. The machine's okay, but the machine's okay to expose the account. Yeah, I actually, you are right, I misspoke on that. The pin is entered by the, the keypad and um, it's sent along the protocol with the credit card with track one. Sorry, yeah, that, that I did misspeak on is that the, the data, well, I was thinking in the world of the protocol again and it, it sends that, the the pin encrypted and the, tra uh, the track one uh, card number through. So, yeah. Any surprises on the physical security side? Um, physical security wise, these things were monsters. Um, they, they are the, if, you know, they show videos of people just walking off with safes and um, I literally have no idea how they do it. Um, these things, it took four of us to move them with a dolly, each ATM, to get them set up for the competition. Um, the, the, my favorite thing about these was when we had finished the competition, there was a class in the classroom following the event. We forgot to take them out because we were just so tired. We're like, okay, we'll get them the next day. And they're like, oh, no, there's a class. And so these students came in and they're like, 
and we're trying to get, we, we walk in and they're like, hey, do you know why there's an ATM in the uh, classroom now? And we're like, no idea, just walked out <laughs> and waited for the class to end. But it was, it was pretty funny. But these things are heavy. They require a lot of effort to move. And so physical security wise, they're pretty good. Um, you could bash this thing pretty well. I don't know what you'd do because, you know, you can wire into the, the front panel, but it, it's going to be pretty obvious. And these places are usually not, you know, easy access. It's, uh, or they're, they're easy access, they're high traffic. So you're not going to be like, okay, just wiring into the, the thing to get it to release. And it also, speaking of serial protocols, you have to know that protocol in advance. So it's, it's fairly physically wise, well designed. Um, it doesn't support EMV, but again, that was an upgrade that you could go through. So, any other questions? All right, thank you guys. Hope you guys enjoyed. <laughs>